Funding for Current Conversations is provided by the University of Oklahoma President's Office, the OU Office of Student Affairs, OU Outreach, and World Literature Today. Welcome to Current Conversations. I'm R.C. Davis Indiano. Today we're talking with three American minority women, Dr. Roxana Lavi about being Iranian American, Matika Wilbur about being an indigenous tribal person, and Dr. Shakti Butler about the experience of being black in America. Join us for this eye-opening discussion about living in the USA. I want to ask you in a moment about changes in the racial climate in America since 9-11. But before that, before I ask you that, what, what has it been like in America even before 9-11 for people uh, from the Middle East who are in the United States? What, was, is there a level of racism or what? Well, thank you for having me here, RC. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I think there was actually a level of racism before even the 9-11 attacks. Um, you know, it's probably the most current, we can think about the events that happened that led to kind of a negative sentiments about the Middle Eastern community have, was after the hostage crisis in Iran in 1979. And given that a lot of people who probably just identify people who look Middle Eastern and also those who don't, like the Sikh population, were also targeted even before 9-11. I think what we saw that happened after 9-11 was just that escalated. There was something like, something about like 500 some incidents against the Middle Eastern community sometime in like a couple of months following the 9-11 attacks. There are people, uh, the Muslim community reported having like their headscarves pulled, they've been spat on. Um, there was most, some of the most current events have been like students getting beat up, being called like this young Muslim woman had like her scarf pulled and was beaten and she was called names like, oh, ISIS, she was ISIS. And so I think there has been some kind of a racism even before and after. There's a lot of people in the Iranian community, which I identify with, that have uh, reported loss of jobs. That's even before 9-11 that... Um, how do you read this? Because, uh, I mean, my guess is that most Americans know almost nothing about cultures in the Middle East. Does this just come out of a fear of, of seeing people unlike themselves, not having knowledge of the world? Uh, how, what's your interpretation of it? Well, you know, people in North America, I mean, we're pretty isolated in the world. We're and we get um, kind of a, one story in the media about, about the people of Middle East. And so there are a lot of people who are not really in touch with those communities. So sometimes people just see one image, and, and that's what uh, the Nigerian-American um, author calls the danger of a single story. So they hear just one story about us, and they think this is a kind of, that's, that's us, and that's the only way that for us to be. And they kind of generalize that with the rest of our population without really... Um, getting to know really who we are or what our cultures are. And so that kind of a stereotyping can lead to people acting in ways that are probably not exactly positive. So they're, so. they're reacting to stereotypes. They so are. there's a single Middle Easterner and they've made it a threatening. Right. So they take the, the what a minority of people have done and they kind of generalize the rest of the population. Now, I think I kind of like to add to what I said is. I don't expect if a white person commits a crime, I don't expect all white people to be criminals. It seems to me there's a kind of urgency here. You know, uh, Americans are very isolated, a little xenophobic, kind of afraid of just cultures unlike their own. Um, there's a really important issue. They, something positive needs to happen. They need to break out of that mm -hmm. xenophobia, right? Well, yes, but at the same time, I think there are some kinds of things like the government can do. I mean, there are kinds of things the media, I mean, just about the time, you know, we've been over 30 years from Iran hostage crisis. Just about the time that a whole generation of children are born, both here and in Iran, and, you know, a second generation of Iranians have grown and gone into public and have gotten jobs, but we're starting to get to know more and more Iranian people. Um, Argo comes out. So it's a kind of like, oh, but see, these are not those people. So it seems like, you know, it, the way I see it is like, 
the background of my identity is Iran hostage crisis. And just when I feel like we could move on, like movies like Argo comes out, that is just a kind of like almost confining again. And it gives a whole new generation of people. I mean, whether or not it's some parts of it are Hollywood, some not, but at the same time, it's just that puts that the crazy people and in, in the kind of the back of people's minds, I think, all over again. I think those are the kinds of things that somewhat irresponsible, socially irresponsible in this kinds of climate to to bring those these back to the front of a whole new generation of Americans when they don't have another story about us. That's the only story they're getting. The, as I listen to you, the word that comes to mind, of course, is Orientalism. Right. And that thesis that in the West there's this caricature of the Middle East and Middle Eastern cultures. And I think you're talking about that showing up in your life and the life of right. the Iranian American community, uh, the ugliness of that large stereotype of Eastern people somehow being outside of culture. I think, I think right. Westerners want to act mm -hmm. that way sometimes. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've got to think that the influence of the presidential candidates right now is, is not helping matters because isn't there a lot of stereotyping going on there about the Middle Eastern community? There is. And, you know, those are the kinds of stereotypes people already had. Um, but I think what when you have people in power, when you have people who are respected in the community, when people who are who have following, the things they say affect what people gives permission. License too. Yeah, right. Give gives gives license, gives permission to people to act. So when you have presidential candidates come out and say we're going to deport all of the, you know, all of the Muslims, or we're not going to allow, or you know, this population do this kinds of things, or Mexicans bring in drugs and crime here. So you're going to have. People are going to listen to that because this is somebody who's got a voice, and so I think what it does, it allows, um, it allows actions. It's words are not just words. Words, words actually, I think, promote kinds of action. So um, they have a lot of power, and I think that when the presidential candidates who've got the mic come out and say these kinds of things, it allow, it allows those people to act on the racism. Was there a moment in your life where you focused on the way mainstream culture saw indigenous people, a kind of maybe indigenous social awakening, where you thought, uh, I need to change this? Uh, mainstream culture, tribal people, they're not in sync in, in the way that they could be. It could be a healthier relationship. Was there, was there some kind of awakening like that? Oh, I see. There were so many. Okay. There were so many. Uh, you know. <clears throat> I, I, I went to Brooks Institute of Photography. I studied advertising, and I thought that I wanted to take pictures of celebrities. So I interned with a celebrity photographer. And then I went to Los Angeles. I worked with very important photographers there. And I went to New York City and worked with important photographers there. And I had this realization that I was making images to sell things that I didn't believe in. And, and so I had a little emotional breakdown. <laughs> and uh, I took an internship, and, and I went to South America, and I began in photographing indigenous people for, uh, this, for these projects of, around food sovereignty and sustainability and trying to understand the global market and how indigenous people are impacted by uh, subsidies in the United States. And there was indigenous farmers that were starving, you know, eating eating potatoes like once every three days, and I was there to photograph it. And then that work, it changed people's lives. It raised awareness and it changed people's lives. And I suddenly realized the transformative power of storytelling. And it was here that I was, I was in the Andes, and I'd been in the Andes for like three or four months, living in like a dirt hut house, <laughs> eating potatoes, <laughs> just to give you some context. And, um, and I had this dream with my grandma who passed away when I was a little girl. And she passed when I was 12 and I adored her. She's this little lady. And I'd never had a dream with her before. And we were shoe shopping in JC Penney's. And I suddenly, I realized I was dreaming and I started crying and I, and I was like, Grandma, you know, like, I just really... While you were dreaming. It was yeah. a lucid dream. Okay. Yeah, I said, I just really don't know what to do. And she said, 
Well, what are you doing photographing these Indians when you haven't even worked with your own people? Go home. Be who you were born to be. You know, my name, Matika, means the messenger. And I was always taught as I was growing up that, and, and this is a common message in Indian country, you know, go to school, get a degree, help your people, come back, help your people. And so when I came home, I started looking around at, um, I, I, I was really trying to figure out what it means to be um, an Indian person. You know, when I left the res when I was 16, I had this idea that reservation life was associated with struggle and despair and poverty. And that's how I thought in my young adolescent mind that, that that's what I thought Indianness was. And so I didn't really want to ever come home to the reservation. And so when I came home in my younger 20s, I then had to decide what this means for me. And I decided to start photographing the elders of all of my different tribes. And so I photographed the original language speakers. Um, at that time in my tribe, there was only eight tribal members that were original language speakers left in my community. Since then, they've all passed. Meaning they learned to speak Lashusit in the home. And they still remembered after the boarding school experience. I then went on to photograph language speakers, original language. And these were people in their 90s in all the different tribes in Washington state. And I would ask them questions. What does it mean to be just to hopes? How, how do I fit in here? What about spirituality when everybody's Catholic? How did that happen? And I had to, I had to hear the stories myself. I needed to understand what happened to our people, how our longhouses were burned, what happened to our children when they went to boarding schools, where this poverty came from, what historical trauma is, why we have this kind of struggle in our communities. It originates from a place, because I've heard stories when there was a time that we had balance and harmony with the earth and all living things, and there wasn't only destruction and sadness. And I I have to think that you're unusual, because if, if a, a person's discovery is that they're seen by the mainstream culture as a vanishing, exotic people from the past, and you've, you've talked about this so eloquently in your photographs and what you've shown and other things, um, that's, a, that's a difficult message to deal with. I think you're one of those strong people who is going to break through whatever barriers are in front of you. But in general, that's got to be a very difficult burden to carry, though to see that the mainstream culture sees you as a vanishing exotic person. I see it's, the danger isn't that mainstream culture sees me as a vanishing Indian. The danger is when I see myself as a vanishing Indian or my children don't see the opportunity for themselves to live. What happens when our own Indian children adopt identities that was never truly theirs? What does it mean in fact to be an Indian? How can you actually be something you never were? So those are the questions you were pondering when you came back and began photographing the tribal elders. Yeah, and you know that was shown in a, it was shown in an exhibition. I had a show in my local town, and all the elders came out and they loved it. And they went to the big museum in Seattle and said, "Seattle Art Museum, we want you to show this." And they said, "Of course we will." And so I had a big exhibition, and then it went to several other different places. And then from there, I was suddenly an artist. You know, mm -hmm. I was suddenly an artist. And so then I did another project called Save the Indian and Kill the Man, which is sort of a spin off the boarding school area. There was a, a, an era in this country, called, and it was an initiative called Kill the Indian to Save the Man. And it, was, it began with a, a man named General Pratt, uh, who actually for years managed the Apache prisoner of war camp in New Mexico. And based off those principles, he opened Carlisle Indian Boarding School in Pennsylvania, which then became the model for all of the Indian boarding schools in the country. And I decided to photograph descendants of that legacy. Who had experienced that? How did it affect their lives? And how did it affect their children's lives? Because, you know, I felt this in because I felt this incredible amount of shame that I didn't speak my language, that I didn't know how to pray in the most traditional ways. I didn't feel like I was Indian enough. 
and that shame and that guilt that overwhelms us. Um, because when I meet somebody, they ask me things like, oh, well, are you a full-blooded Indian? As though my pedigree should be proven like an animal. Prove yourself, yeah. They, they ask me if I grew up in a teepee. They ask me basically indicators of authenticity. Well, you say you're an Indian, but really what makes you an Indian? And it's really, it's ironic because there was assimilation, systemic assimilation practices put into place by the U.S. government to eradicate the culture and identity of the Native American person in this country. And I learned about that when I did this project. And for me, it was a, 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 a form of reconciliation, trying to, to find peace with my own sense of Indianness and, and my lack of Indianness. If you could convey one message about social justice for indigenous people to America, on the show, for example, a lot of people will see this show. What would you like them to, to know? We've oftentimes, I, I hear the argument that social justice or inequality is a thing of the past. We have integration. We have... Uh, we're, we're all created equal. It's government for the people. It's important to recognize that for the people was not for the people, the black people, for the people, the Indian people. It was for the white people, the ones that were legal to vote, the ones that were right. considered people. And if we really want to know, if we, if we want to take an honest look at equity in this country, all we have to do is look at body count. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a very visceral experience. It's, it's perpetuating itself in, in the bodies, the safety of our bodies. Three out of four Native women experience sexual assault or domestic violence in mm -hmm. their lifetime. For many of us, it's not a question of if, but rather a question of when. Mm -hmm. Across the border in Canada, we have an estimated 1,200 stolen sisters. Our children are at the highest rate for suicide in the country. Only 50% of our students are graduating from high school. We don't have the resources that we need to sustain our communities. And so, I don't think that the argument needs to be made whether or not uh, things are equitable. Uh, I think the one thing that we could all learn from is that it is in the acknowledgement that we are on indigenous land. Right now, where we're sitting right now, we're in Ohlone territory. There is an indigenous history of this place. And we would all be better if we learned from that. And I offer those lessons through images. Mm -hmm. Others offer it through books. Others offer through curricula. The information is available. And I do believe that if we want to break down um, borders and you know, invisible lines between us, and we want things to change, we have to get to know one another. We break bread. We become friends. We reach across and we say, Look, I got you. You are not alone. I'll take care of you. What do you need? This is what I can do. And when we do that with one another, one relationship at a time, we build community. And we no longer are afraid of one another. And the differences between us and the color of our skin suddenly doesn't look so much different. Mm -hmm. But that only happens when we have true connectivity. And, and so that, to me, is, is what I'm hoping for. Now, I know you've been thinking a lot recently, or maybe it goes back quite a while, 
about the school to prison pipeline. Yes, yes. I, I think people hear that term a lot and maybe really don't know a lot about what's involved. Could you walk us through that? Sure. Um, I wouldn't call myself an expert on the school to prison pipeline. What I'm deeply interested in is what is justice? Because we understand that we have a highly disproportionate number of students of color who do find themselves on the road to ending up in prison repeatedly over the course of their lives for sometimes very minor infractions, sometimes serious infractions. But it begins with the fact that they're not being treated well or they come to school with a lot of trauma. And people don't ask, what happened to you? They ask, what did you do? What did you do wrong? Well, you know, if I saw my brother get beat up last night, or my father's in prison, or my mom is whatever, uh, you know, I'm going to come to school maybe not so interested in learning. Mm -hmm. So nobody's at, I think at the Harlem Kid Zone, where the, the approach was change a whole environment. Right. And you get different outcomes. Yes. Um, I, I, we seem to be so eager to put people in prison. I mean, that, that's really, the, that's the fact you're dealing with, isn't right. it? With young people going right. to prison right. when they shouldn't. Right and then it's formative for them. Right. Well, there are a lot of studies that show that racism goes as far as interpreting who people are by the way they look. So, for example, you think about Tamir Rice, who was shot. When the officer called that in, he said, we've just shot an African-American male 20 years old. Tamir Rice was 12. But what happens is that when people are in that category of other, we don't really see them. The brain actually does not process information to allow you to see a person for who they are. And so it's very quick for this uh, unconscious bias, which really overrides the conscious mind of the brain. It's very quick to move to a place where you defer people to categories in which they do not belong. There's something terribly outmoded in our thinking about race, too, don't you think? Because uh, the racial categories that have come down to us in, in, the, in the Americas and from Europe and other places have been completely undermined by the Human Genome Diversity Project. Yes, yes. Where it turns out that there's greater, uh, uh, di there are greater differences within ethnic groups and there are separating right. ethnic groups. So the, the scientific base is totally gone right. for thinking about race. Right. Well, I think what you're talking about is the difference between the biology of race and okay. the cultural application of otherness, which race falls into that category, of course. So um, here's the deal. We don't think about race systemically. We think about race as, do you like me? Am I a good person? Am I racist? That's the real trigger. Am I racist? When really, systems are all about understanding patterns and relationships. Mm -hmm. So the system of racialization really is uh, well, let me break it down this way. If we talk about your human body, your body as a system, you understand that there are a lot of parts that are working together in order to sustain your life. That is what the system is designed to do, is to sustain life. Your system, with all these different parts, have a lot of structures mm -hmm. that support the system in doing its job. So your brain, your circulatory system, all of that kind of stuff. So the system of racialization is the same thing. It is designed, it has evolved into a system whose job it is to turn out inequities. The system of racialization is all about behavior that's embedded in history, which we do not learn, which impacts culture, which also informs who we are in terms of our, our identity formation. But it's moved by power and economics, and it has internal components and external components. The internal components are bias, both conscious and unconscious, privilege, and internalized racism, the wounding that happens when you hear messages repeatedly that tell you who you are, uh, that you may or may not even be aware of at the time. But all of those internal components and the situatedness and the power in economics play out externally. They play out interpersonally. Mm -hmm. They play out in our institutions through policies and, and laws and customs, and that's just the way it's always been. And they play out structurally, which means institutional knowledge coming together to, to perpetuate basically the same message, who belongs, who doesn't belong, who's intelligent, who's not intelligent, all of that kind of stuff. And it's so, it's so deep in the history of our country, it's very hard to overcome. It seems like if but you're talking about so many interesting things, if we unbundle some of the things you're talking about, it seems to me there are probably assumptions that if people actually face them singly, they wouldn't accept them. Let me just pick one. 
uh, phenotype. The idea that we can read a person's destiny and what that person is like based on skin color, body shape, hair, eye color, all of that. And uh, put in those strict terms, a lot of people would say that can't possibly be right. And yet racism works that way, where uh, those characteristics uh, for a lot of people work as destiny. I look at you, I see those features, I know what the limits are in your life. People wouldn't accept that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think the question that needs to be asked is where did this knowledge, this, this perspective about phenotype, where did it come from and for what purpose? So the human psyche has to rationalize why it would other people. If you need free labor, if you need cheap labor, right. then you have to somehow um, be able to validate how you can treat people poorly. Right. And that becomes a cultural, that gets embedded into the culture and passed on. I'll give you a, a different kind of example. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm a very light-skinned African-American woman, and I grew up in Harlem, and when I would go to school, the first thing I would do when I got to history class is look in the back of the book to see where I was. Mm -hmm. Where were my people? We were never there. You know, we, 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 weren't, we weren't part of the intelligence, the leadership. You know, everything around me supported who belonged where. And even though I couldn't articulate it as a, you know, junior high school, high schooler, I knew something was missing. Mm -hmm. But I also had the advantage of going to the Schomburg library all the time, where I found the answers of what African people have done, you know? And so there's this disconnect between who we really are and what our history really is and how we're perceived in the United States.